afternoon everyone my name is crystal if you like my videos please smash that like button please do subscribe good afternoon alexa what's the time please the time is 3 24 pm alexa thought of the day here's your thought to succeed you must have tremendous perseverance tremendous will i will drink the ocean says the persevering soul and my wall mountains will crumble up. Have that sort of energy, that sort of will. Work hard and you will reach the goal. Put by Swami Vivekananda. Right, it is Monday afternoon. Around two o'clock, um, I always take my chihuahua out for a walk. It's not always dead on two. Today, my neighbour next door has got a dash hound. Um... She took her dog out first, um, so I waited till she came back, so it was just after two that I took my dog out for a walk, and as I left my door I could hear her chatting on her phone, she's got a really loud voice, and I just got into the lift and um, I came out of the building. I at that stage was feeling like most women do when they've got their monthlies a lot of women uh, feel terrible now mine was supposed to have stopped and I didn't have a monthly period for nearly a year and all of a sudden I'm getting a monthly period again and it doesn't seem right to me but I'm going to go with it I've had a pelvic scan and the doctor thinks uh, he's going to discuss the results over the phone in the middle to late stage of April so it can't be serious right so I'm putting it down to periods with endometriitis and it's painful, I feel irritable, I just want to lie down and rest and hug a hot water bottle. I don't really want to do anything but I have to because I live by myself, which is fair enough, a load of people live by themselves and they have to get on with things. So a lot of the time distraction works with me so I try and occupy in my mind with something else to do because otherwise I will sit there and I will start getting agitated, angry, annoyed and there's no point to that so I got some fresh orange juice I drank a cup full of fresh orange juice Again, I splashed my face with water because I've been feeling really, really tired. And I had some chicken soup. I didn't, I didn't actually feel like eating. I didn't feel like eating anything, so I had some chicken soup. I ate the chicken soup before I left my flat as well. Because otherwise I wouldn't have eaten anything. I had a banana for breakfast and a couple of crisps as a snack because I felt low in energy so um, somebody was pissing me off by text message like you know annoying me talking bullshit crap pretending to be somebody that they weren't and I just blocked the call and now I feel better and I hope nobody else starts irritating me um, so I went out, I walked across and I thought, right, I'm not going on the field. There was a guy dressed in like, it was, you know, you know when you watch the telly, uh, like body of evidence or something like that. And, um, you know, forensics, when they're cleaning up mess, when someone's died or something, they're all dressed in like, you know, forensic gear. So I was, I thought, well, I'm not going up there. There was this guy in a white helmet dressed in a white plastic-like 
body suit. I thought I'm not going on to the field this afternoon. Bright lights on. I mean, it's broad daylight and they've got obviously security lights on. So right in my face, I thought, no, I'm not going on there again. I went on there this morning. So I just walked around and I took it at a slow pace because I was feeling tired and I'd spoken to my mum this morning and she said she could hardly walk. My mum could hardly walk when she got out of the car with Charlotte and Stuart in it. She was really hunched over. And um, I picked up the phone because, you know, I, <laughs> I hardly speak to anybody. I can go weeks without speaking to anyone. And I thought, right, I'll see how she is. So when I see my mum this week, we see how hunched over she is. But Charlotte and Stuart have, have went round there. They must have gone round there yesterday and seen how my mum was. I'm going to go up this week and have a, a, see how she is again. And we go from there. Um... I just walked around um, the block and I came back into my flat and I put LBC radio on and it's all about cancer and people's mums dying, their dads dropping dead and it's quite alarming, it's alarming. If you're on your own in your flat and you're sort of an anxious person or you worry, I was listening to a guy, right, and he said, oh, my dad, my, uh, he said he was 21, I must, he sounded older, and he'd lost both his parents. He said his mum dropped dead, and then his dad dropped, his dad dropped dead, he's only 21, and both his mum and dad had died. But it was the way he was talking. Oh, and my dad dropped dead. Um, very young to lose your parents at 21 years of age. It does happen. Uh, shocking. She directed this young lad to cruise. The charity cruise. Alexa, what is the charity cruise? From the dailymail.com. The charity cruise is raising money for breast cancer patients and survivors. So his mother must have uh, died of breast cancer. So the whole news is dominated by cancer. You put on the telly, you go onto YouTube, it's cancer, cancer, cancer. And um, it's distressing. We know it exists, we know it's uh, alarming, but do we want it in our ears 24-7? So, um, I've been on and off listening to the radio. Yes, I could put music on, but my ear is, um, I'm not going to swear, I swore too much in the last video because I feel uh, a bit grotty today. So we keep the swearing down. My ear is damaged. Right? So at the moment I can't listen to music. At all. It's damaged. Uh, my son was playing music up to a really, really high volume. He's a young lad. He's in his 20s. And he wants to listen to music while he's driving. That's fair enough. But my ears are shocked. I'm in my middle 50s and my ears are shocked. They're shocked. And um, I, I had a balance problem when I came back. When I got out of my son's car, and I'll be blatantly honest, when I got out of my son's car, I have a problem with my, I've got nerve damage to my face and my ear. And my son had been listening to music right up the top of the volume. So he turned the knob right up high. Um, you know, I'm sure he, when he's in the car with his brother, he probably does the same thing. But I'm his mum, and it nearly shot my ears out. And I got out of my son's car, and we walked to Rochester from Strew. 
because it was the easiest pa place to park his car because outside my flats you have to have a parking permit and I haven't got a parking permit because I don't drive um, so my son left his car in Morrison's car park or, or near Morrison's car park which was a four hour stay a car park at the Strood Retail Park sorry uh, near next to Matalan he parked his car opposite the next shop and um, basically I was finding it difficult to keep straight because when you've got problems with your ears it affects your balance and my son had been listening to music so loud it had shot one of my ears so I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I'm going to keep be able to stand up straight. Um, so, yeah, my ears are sore. And I've also got an exposed root in my tooth. So everything makes it get shocked and it hurts. I've, I've told you about this uh, obscure tooth I've got left that if that it's I've been told it's a leaky filling um, and um, it needs extracting it's an abscess tooth and it's still in there and it fucking gives me sorry it gives me grief every now and then as well so loud noises again drilling you know drilling um, and I'm trying to just remain independent and, and keep going so yeah I went outside I came back and I thought right let's tackle the washing up let's tackle the washing up let's tackle my washing and um, we, we, you know, we, we got we tidy up the flat. We we distract ourselves from endometriitis because it is it is painful, it is horrible. And of course, I thought my periods had finished, so I've got they've started again. And then I've got the worry if I'm going to bleed like I did last time and need a blood transfusion. So I'm making sure I'm taking my vitamins with iron in them. And I'm eating strawberries and I'm going to get some spinach and broccoli and eat loads of greens so I don't have to go to the hospital. And my mum, like I said, she rang me on the field and she, she, she wanted me to go up there today. And I thought, no, not today. I'm extremely tired. I don't want to have an argument with anybody. Um, I don't feel well so I just kept cool and now I'm, we put LBC radio on last night I was depressed in my flat and they were talking about suicide Alexa LBC radio LBC London from Global Player a couple of examples we, with China, were the duty bearers of the Sino-British Joint Declaration that was supposed to govern Hong Kong and was supposed to promise the people of Hong Kong that we would uphold their way of life and their autonomy. China has torn that to pieces since 2019. And what has the UK done about it? Well, unfortunately, not very much. We've opened up visas for Hong Kongers to come over here, but almost nothing to hold Beijing to account. So it's consistent with the UK's approach that we wouldn't want to stand up to Beijing when it does stuff that we don't like, unfortunately. So today would be highly unusual if it is what we think it's going to be. He has called, the Prime Minister has called China the greatest state-based threat to our economic security. Do you agree with that? Yeah, that's certainly true. Um, How so? He's... Well, uh, the MI5 and uh, FBI uh, joint chiefs gave a statement last year to exactly that effect. They said that the biggest uh, threat to our security was China, mainly because of the United Front Work Department. Now, this is um, a relatively complex institution to try to explain, but basically we're talking tens of thousands of people who are in other people's countries trying to do the Chinese Communist Party's bidding. Um, 
by, in the words of the Intelligence and Security Committee report only uh, a few months ago, by penetrating every area of the UK economy. That was the Intelligence and Security Committee report's conclusion. So, yeah, the overseas influence operations of China are extraordinarily broad. Um, we have not been willing to face up to them. This is a good sign that perhaps, finally, the government's willing to say, hey, you know, enough is enough. Uh, we need to wake up and smell the coffee, deal with China as it actually is, rather than what we hoped it might become 10 to 15 years ago. There will be differences, of course, but are there parallels between the um, rather sleepy relationship we had with Russian oligarchs in this country before the invasion of Ukraine? Um, yeah, I, mean, I think there are a lot of people saying that. It, it's just, what's really different is that our economy and the Chinese economy are entwined in very different ways. So picking that apart is really difficult. We have to engage with China. Nobody is saying that we sort of pull up the drawbridge and don't talk to China at all. But we've got to engage with them realistically and not expose our critical national infrastructure or many other areas of life to crippling dependency, where we're so dependent that we can't say, we can't stand up for our values to China, we can't stand up to the bully. Unfortunately, over the past 10, 15 years, we've really just fed the beast. And in fact, the international community has done that. And now China is getting so powerful that, for example, we can't even win a vote on Uyghurs in the United Nations Human Rights Council because China is, through its influence, through the Belt and Road Initiative in so many countries has effectively bought the votes. We can't have that situation. We need to be able to stand and for up. people who might not know who the Uyghurs are, there's a, a, a large, large numbers of Uyghurs in China um, who have been uh, arrested, detained, some tortured in so-called re-education camps. And they're, they're Muslim. Yeah, um, they are, well, they're an ethnic group, predominantly Muslim, and Yes, very unfortunately, up to two million of them have been extrajudicially detained, many of them subject to forced labour, forced sterilisation of tens of thousands of Uyghur women, which has led some people credibly to accuse China of genocide through forced prevention of births yeah. of Uyghurs. So this is really serious stuff. It was on that basis, actually, that a whole bunch of parliamentarians in our country were sanctioned by China because they stood up for Uyghurs. Um, people like Nusrat Ghani MP and, and many others, Ian Duncan Smith and, and Tim Rawson, they were all sanctioned by China, not because, um, well, they were doing anything wrong, but because they were exercising their democratic freedoms to try to stand up for human rights. Uh, China doesn't want to brook dissent around this stuff, not just at home, where they crush dissent um, mercilessly, as Hong Kong has shown us, uh, but also abroad. They're trying to subvert the way that we conduct our own free democratic debate, and that's not acceptable. So the steps that the government's taking today, I hope, um, in a limited way, we can welcome them and push for more. I'm just looking at the statement, which, forgive me if I appear to be looking away from you when you're talking to me, the statement is, uh, is being uh, given to the House now in the House of Commons. I've just been keeping tabs on what he said. Nothing that will, uh, you know, rock a boat at this stage, but who knows, he might get there. Can I ask you, and I ask this question very carefully, because clearly um, many Chinese students in this country are, China, are just students in this country studying legitimately and contributing uh, both now and potentially in the future to the country. But, it, it, but is, there, is there a question mark? over the numbers of Chinese students in our universities and, and arguably even universities' reliance on their money, their fees. Yeah, this is a developing problem and it's something that actually many vice chancellors across the country would admit. Um, we had a period of engagement with China where we were signalling that we should do more and more, not less. And now we've ended up in a situation with deteriorating bilateral relations where it's really difficult because those universities make a loss on every domestic student. They rely on foreign fees. Mm. So if you're a university like the University of the Arts London with a very high proportion of students from the PRC, you can't afford... People's uh, Republic to, of China. Yeah. Yes, indeed, yeah. You, you can't afford to upset them and you can end up in situations where that might even subvert uh, free academic debates in UK universities and has done in some circumstances. So. Now, that's very worrying, but the thing I really don't like about it, and you're hinting at it too, is that it's very sad to make uh, Chinese students carry the can for the behaviour of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, but sadly, that's where we are. And Beijing has shown itself willing uh, to threaten universities with the removal of its students if the universities upset them or say things that they don't like. 
so yeah, this is this is a pressing problem to which we don't really have a, a, a coherent policy response yet. And if we did say, right, things are going to change, how, how could they change in our relationship with China? Well, we need to do a few things. First of all, we really do have to engage with China as it really is, with Beijing as it really is, the Chinese Communist Party in 2024, not what Cameron thought or hoped it might be back in 2010. Um, which is an expansionist totalitarian state with an unrivaled programme of foreign interference, um, which is trying to reshape the international rules-based system in its own image. Um, this presents really um, serious, profound challenges to the rest of the world. We rely on these systems in order to be able to trade freely and to attempt to protect uh, universal values. Um, and China is undermining those. So what can we do? Well, it well, doesn't believe first... them, does it? Obviously. See the weakness um, with each other. Yes, well, I mean, I would certainly argue that. They argue that they just have a different vision of human rights, or human rights, as they say, with Chinese characteristics. Um, so it's, it's not that they want to completely uh, tear the rug out from under the whole thing. They want to reshape it in a way that favours and benefits the policies and strategies and ideology of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, so look, we, we need to reduce dependency on China. That's the thing that we really urgently need to do, particularly in areas of critical national infrastructure, where we're very exposed. I'll just give you one example, renewable energy, where we, um, well, went with solar power, for example, about 90% of the key ingredient for solar power, power, polysilicon, comes from China, and about 40% of that comes from the Uyghur region in China, and is strongly linked to forced labour. You know, through net zero, we've actually legislated ourselves into dependency on Uyghur forced labour, very tragically. Um, and we've done that because China had a very explicit strategy to inculcate that dependency. And Xi Jinping even says this. So Random. we, well, we've just been blind to it. We've walked into it, we've been extremely naive about it. And here we are thinking, oh dear, now we're so dependent on China for these things that we're not gonna be able to achieve these net zero targets if we, um, if we upset them or if we end up in a situation where we have less favorable trading relationships with them. So we're in, a, we're in a mess, but we can get ourselves out of it by working with our allies to reduce our dependency upon China. We need to do that in a coordinated way. But we also need to be willing to hold China to account for its abuses of the international system, but also of yeah, domestic human rights. Um, what about, just a quick word on tech and social media and China. Think Huawei, think TikTok. Yes, well, look, the, the vector through which um, China is conducting a lot of its overseas influence activities is tech and some of those are non-state actors. Um, the, the piece of the puzzle which, which is often lost over the TikTok story is that, yeah, you know, there's a problem with the manipulation of algorithms and what people might see, but one of the big issues is data leakage. You know, the parent company of TikTok is ByteDance and because of the legal situation in China, um, you know, the government can request access to data whenever they want, and the company has to comply and has to lie about it if they're asked. So this is clearly not a secure situation 